Welcome back to the last section that we need to go through for our physics course that we're doing. This is the Grade 12 Queensland Physics Syllabus and we're following the textbook by Walden. Chapter 14.3, Symmetry in Particle Interactions. So we looked at the Feynman diagrams uh, last section, showed how those uh, particles from the standard model can interact with each other and how we depict it. Now we just want to look at a few more little rules around symmetry. Nice little picture on the screen there for you about the uh, extent of the radio signals that we've sent out as humans and that's pretty much as far as they go in the Milky Way so kind of small all right so just have a think can a particle travel backwards in time there's a nice little joke there on the screen you might want to uh, pause it and have a look at that but how, how can a particle travel backwards in time answer it's kind of the way, similar to what we talk when we refer to conventional current, is positive charge travelling backwards in a circuit. It's not really that any particles are travelling backwards in time. It's just kind of how we show it on those diagrams. Um, how do you know if uh, gluons exist if we can't see them? In fact, we can't see any of these particles in the standard model. So how do we know they exist? And the short answer is we have evidence that they exist comes down to indirect effects of how electrons or quarks or gluons influence their surroundings. The gluon doesn't necessarily exist as a free particle that can travel uh, distances that we can kind of understand. It's not really a real particle like a photon or something like that. So it's kind of a, a weird understanding. According to the underlying physical theories, the gluon is, a re is as real as a photon. We can see evidence of it. It's kind of like... Um, when Rutherford first did his gold foil experiment where he shot um, alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold foil and looked at the uh, scattering pattern of them and looked at how most of them went through and then concluded that most of the atom was sort of empty space. It was sort of like evidence of what was going on even though we can never ever really see it because it's so much smaller than anything visible. Another question here for you. Uh, if you shook hands with someone from an antimatter universe, would you both cancel each other out? We know that matter and antimatter annihilate each other. So what's going on here? What would happen? Basically, as soon as you, uh, you touch your anti-twin's hand, there's a massive burst of gamma rays of the energy of those uh, atoms at the edge there touching each other and annihilating each other and producing those gamma rays, that uh, those photons. And that massive blast would basically blast you back and thereby sort of limiting the uh, explosive force and uh, how much of you annihilates with your anti-you. Kind of a nice thing to think about. Right, what are we doing today? C uh, symmetry in particle interactions is what we're going to do. And we're going to be able to identify and recall some symmetry and draw some related Feynman diagrams, basically explain what this whole idea of symmetry is and give some examples. Right, so what do we mean by symmetry? You'll know what the idea of symmetry is. In mathematics, we talk about rotational symmetry, like those um, squares on the screen there, are literally just rotating a, a 90 degree rotation every move. We know that the laws of uh, physics are sym sym undergo symmetry of operations. Basically, the laws of physics, no matter where you are on Earth, will always apply the same. Similarly, uh, as you travel through time, the laws of uh, physics still will apply. And we saw back in relativity that even your frame of reference does not um, change the laws of physics. They should still all be the same no matter what your inertial reference frame is. All right, so let's have a look at what we mean by symmetry on these particle interactions. And the first type we'll look at is crossing symmetry. So think of this reaction here. So A plus B reacts to give us C plus D. So there's um, two particles interacting with each other and being replaced with two other particles on the other side. Now, what we've done here is we've moved a B over the other side and called it an anti-B particle. So it's almost like the antimatter particle of B is on the other side of the um, reaction now. So instead of A and B reacting to give us C and D, it's almost like A 
is breaking down to give us C and D still, but also the anti-B particle. There's another sort of way to look at it. Think of instead of a, a C particle on the uh, product side, we've got an anti-C on the reactants. And it's almost like this guy here is the total opposite of this guy here, and he's on the other side of the reaction. So that's what an example of what we call crossing symmetry. Same thing there. A and B are now antiparticles. C is now an antiparticle, and D is still where he is. And there's the whole reaction reversed with total antiparticles. And that's what we refer to as crossing symmetry. There's a little uh, link there to, if you want to know more about that. All right. Consider electron positron annihilation. So now we're going to look at an example of this using some of the um, uh, standard model particles we've discussed. So we've got an electron plus a positron annihilating to give us two photons. So if we apply a crossing symmetry to swap one things to the other side, and don't forget the antiparticle of an electron is a positron, so he can go over this side and become a positron, and it's still an acceptable um, interaction. But the photon, don't forget, is its own antiparticle. We mentioned that back in the last chapter. So what we've done there is um, our positron has moved over the other side and become an electron because it's the antiparticle of, of itself. And one of the photons has moved over to the reactant side there of our interaction, so to speak, to use a chemistry term. All right, and this is like an example of Compton scattering that we looked at in the last section where an electron and a positron can bounce off each other, so to speak. All right, crossing symmetry. And this is basically the idea where something can literally just cross over the other side of a Feynman diagram. And I guess to uh, put it sort of simply, if you look at the figure four at the top there, what's the difference between the two images? All right, we don't have a positron over here. We now have an electron over the other side of the, um, the vertice there where the interaction's occurring. And that should look familiar in that they have a neutron decaying into a proton. So if we consider our neutron decay, we have a neutron decaying into a proton, an electron, and an electron antineutrino. If we apply this crossing symmetry, we can put something over the other side, like we've done there. Now, this is a little, looks a little bit weird in that I've kind of almost reversed these two here. So the neutron's over here and our electron went over the other side and became a positron over there. All right, neutron decay, neutrino detection is an example of crossing symmetry. Charge reversal symmetry. Interactions are not affected uh, if all the charges are swapped, so positive, negative, vice versa. If we swap all the charges, this is an example of reversing charges but keeping our symmetry. So our situation here, we have pion decay. Pion decays into a muon and a muon antineutrino. So there's our pion, our muon, and our muon neutrino, sorry. Now if we swap them all, we change the charges. So change the positive charge in that uh, muon to a negative charge, uh, on that pion, sorry. The muon becomes a negative charge, and the muon neutrino becomes an anti-muon neutrino. What's probably not quite so clear here is that think of this as the particle and this as the antimatter particle. So we've effectively, by charge reversal, I mean, we've swapped it from matter to antimatter. That's what we're doing. And same with the muon in the middle there. All right. Time reversal symmetry. An atomic scale, time is reversible. Hence, in a reaction, products can become reactants and reactants can become products. And that's kind of like what we've sort of been trying to sort of allude to here. And effectively, what we've done here in the diagram on the screen here is we had a proton decaying into a neutron. Now we have a neutron decaying into a proton. It's just the opposite reaction there. All right, in an inverse beta decay in which a proton captures an orbital electron to form a neutron and electron neutrino, 
This is an electron capture and leads to an increase in stability by reducing the proton number. This is like the radioactive decay we saw way back in Unit 1. Uh, it's like a time reversal. We just flip the diagram around. Um, this is beta decay, whereby a nucleus reduces its neutron number. A neutron grabs an electron neutrino and forms a proton and electron. We're just showing examples of here how you can literally just flip the whole reaction around or the whole interaction around. And that's what we call time reversal symmetry. It's just like the reverse reaction is still acceptable. Here's an example for you. So in this example here, draw a Feynman diagram to show time reversal symmetry of this example here. And describe the interaction. Now if we look at what we've got, we've got a proton decaying to a neutron. It's capturing an electron antineutrino and giving off a positron. All we're doing to show time reversal symmetry is flipping the whole thing around. And if you look at this diagram here, it's just the opposite. Everything's flipped. And it's just showing that the reverse reaction can still occur. It's still acceptable. It still deals, uh, ex um, satisfies all our laws of conservation. And the opposite can happen. And we just call it time symmetry. So reading what it says, uh, a proton interacts with an electron antineutrino to form a neutron and a positron. In a time reverse diagram, uh, which is figure three, a neutron interacts with a positron to form a proton and an electron antineutrino. Okay? Ever stopped and thought that if we have electrons and we have positrons, maybe sometimes we should just call that an electroff instead of a positron, because that would be the opposite of electron. Electron, electroff, yeah. Don't give up your day job. Okay, so summarize. Three important symmetries in particle physics. Charge reversal, time reversal, and crossing symmetry. Symmetry op operations generally occur in particle interactions and allow the prediction of new reactions. That's why we kind of do this. We're just describing how we can change things around. And if we're satisfying our, our three symmetry interactions that we've discussed, charge, time, and crossing, then that will allow us to look at all the interactions possible and predict new reactions that we can um, identify. We can predict ones that we haven't actually got evidence of yet and work out if they're possible and then start to look for the evidence of it. And this is how we can start to find more and more interactions and more particles. Uh, in the symmetry, energy and momentum are always conserved. We always know that. Um, we do, however, come across some particle interactions that don't demonstrate symmetry. We've uh, identified a few in our particle accelerators where the symmetry is not uh, satisfied. So this is just basically giving us extra data and this is how we start to investigate further interactions and start to look for more exotic particles that we haven't discovered before. Said another way, here's five sort of points. There's a little mnemonic here. Three pigs came up the valley to help you remember it. Three, there's three types of symmetries we spoke about. Charge, time and crossing. Pigs predict, predict, it helps us predict these different interactions and the probability of new interactions may be unknown, but we can still predict what is possible because this effectively all comes down to a probability interaction. What's the probability of these things occurring? It may be very, very low, but it's still possible. Came up the valley, so conservation. There must be conservation of energy and momentum. Um, up, so that's universal, so not universal. So there are a couple of cases where symmetry is not um, adhered to. Symmetry is violated. And this tells us that you know, there's more work we need to do in this area. We're literally at the cutting edge of what we really understand here. Um, and this violation, that's the V Valley violation, just gives us with evidence that we need to investigate this further and we start to, inter um, start to interrogate those interactions a bit further and work out why the symmetry is violated. Another way to put it here, all right, which simply says the same thing, okay? We have the three types of symmetries. Symmetry operations are generally upheld in nature, but there are some examples which gives us more work to do. All right, just a little bit of extension. How do we know this stuff? How do we know this happens? Large Hadron Collider, other detectors, all right? There's a little video out there called Beyond the Atom, which gives you a bit more info in it. 
but we basically smash these particles together in these particle detectors like the Large Hadron Collider and we look for what particles come out of it. We can look at um, things called a bubble chamber. This is another little extension. It's basically where we have this um, chamber like the one we see on the screen here where um, we sort of increase the volume like we did there. All right, turn the camera on and watch what happens and we have a magnetic field running and we can see particles move through this chamber, this chamber here, because we see a trail they make. All right, cylindrical chamber filled with a liquid just below boiling point. Pistons move to increase the volume. High energy particles leave a path of ionized molecules as they pass through the chamber. It causes this um, fluid to vaporize, forming bubbles, hence it's called a bubble chamber. And a magnetic field deflects the charged particles. Think back to unit three. Think back to your hand rules and all that sort of stuff. When a charged particle is moving through a magnetic field, it is deflected one way or the other. That's the principle we're using here. So this ties back into that stuff we did when we were talking about electricity. We get diagrams, a bit like these guys here. All right. All right. Different examples there where the particle, for example, forms these little funny spiral shapes and so on depending on its charge and if you look at the cover of the Walding textbook you actually have a picture of one of these bubble chamber diagrams of one of these particle interactions so that's how we know these things are going on a bit of further reading there you can have a look at that one don't forget the uh, online obook thing gives you some more stuff to have a look at you can check your understanding here what operation turns this one into this one. Pause the video, have a look. What have I changed about those two to make it occur? This is the charge reversal symmetry. Okay, I turned this into its antiparticle over here, and I turned this one into its antiparticle over there. And obviously, that is its own antiparticle, but it didn't move. Unchanged particles haven't really changed because I'm talking about charge reversal. All right. This is the crossing symmetry one here. All right, go and have a look at the screen now. What have I done? I've crossed things over to the other side. All right, I have this one here, which is moved over the other side. All right, another one here. Take this interaction here of this high energy electron emitting a photon going to a low energy state. Think of an electron going from a high energy level to a lower energy level. That's kind of how we're depicting that. It's releasing energy, releasing a photon. What symmetry operations can you think? Think of our crossing symmetry, our charge symmetry, all of those things. Can you come up with them? Pause the video, have a go at it. Can you find seven of them? And here they are here. Here's a nice little potential exam question. In beta decay, a neutron converts to a proton. Can you explain on a quark level what's going on there? And this is similar to those Feynman diagrams we talked about in the last section. Have a look at the little diagrams I've got here. All right, a down quark's changing into an up quark with the emission of an electron and an anti-neutrino. Can you sort of explain that yourself? Can you uh, remember how to write out a paragraph to explain what's going on there? Make sure you can do that. Don't ignore what I said on this last slide. Make sure you can do that. All right, so we've looked at uh, symmetry, describe what they are. You should be able to identify and recall the types of symmetries. And you need to remember these relate back to our Feynman diagrams. There's a nice little um, check your learning things to have a crack at. Then you can go and have a look at the chapter review. And that would complete this chapter for you. And that completes the course. So like Phil Dunphy says, well done. And for those of us a little bit older that used to watch the Looney Tunes when we were little kids, like Porky Pig says, that's all folks. Thanks for coming guys. Now we're on the home run to the final exam. We've got a lot of revision to do.